Um, I was just wondering whether, given that um, aspect of the government at the moment, whether there is any kind of grand strategy or whether it is purely statecraft, in your opinion? Um, so, firstly, uh, the first question was, did I? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I was actually very clear when I was writing it that I was going to do everything I could to not turn it into a rant about how much I dislike David Cameron. Um, so, I steered away from stuff like that. But, um, yeah, sure. Um, and the, the same, you see the same, uh, that's a picture that's come out about Thatcher a lot. Thatcher isn't like, she, at first, the early period of the Thatcher regime, policies were conflictual, uh, no clear path, like mission, we're going to do this. Just various loosely tied together, semi-ideological policies, generally op operating in some kind of vaguely liberal sphere. Um, so they're, they're not always going to be perfectly um, <laughs> coherent. And I guess that's the same as what you see with Cameron. Um, that you know you can you have to talk about the big society, but at the same time you don't actually really back it up with policy. Um, because then just he's got this set of nice sounding ideas um, which kind of work together. And I think the most coherent way, as you say, of, uh, of explaining that is the statecraft idea. That essentially there is no definite um, ideological <coughs> path, there's just a belief that a few big things have to happen and that he wants to be the person who makes those happen. Okay, thank you. Um, would it be fair to glean from what you said that in terms of Labour versus Conservative you would say Labour would be the lesser of two evils? Um, I'm just going to go off that depending on how you answer it, and then ask something else, if that's all right. Um, I, I guess the obvious response is lesser of two evils in regard to what? Um, um, uh, the, the, the thrust of what I was saying is that Cameron is lying to us when he said, or not lying, but I, I can't know whether he knows <laughs> that he's misleading us. He's probably brought the telegraph line mm. that Labour were massively fiscally irresponsible, which is actually, when you look at the graph and you see with massive troughs, that's your first impression until you actually like cut, cut it back and extrapolate it forwards and see where we would right. be if it wasn't for the crash. So I don't know if Cameron is necessarily lying, but the point is that Cameron's message isn't true. Of course, it's just more the point. Um, <coughs> did you go to the Alistair Darling talk earlier? I did not. Right. Um, <laughs> essentially, the general crux of it when uh, people were basically calling BS on him um, was a massive amount of incompetency and I respected the fact that he did flat out say in regard to the banking crisis we didn't know what was going on like the bank people didn't know what was going on they didn't go know what was going on he was the Chancellor and he didn't know what was going on so I appreciate the graphs and everything and yes you've got to look at different information and the different trends and everything but to almost just Bob Cameron off as um, being a liar and just turning his finger on Labour and said, you screwed it all up. Well, kind of did. And also, you've got Ed <laughs> Miliband now. I know in the opposition, this is always what they do. They'll turn around and say how awful everything is. And if you actually listen, he's not giving any alternatives, no viable alternatives necessarily. Hey, Ken, well, Livingston, I'm, I'm, Ken Livingston I'm, in the mayoral election, Ed barely even backed him. There's this whole theory, of, if there's anyone but... Ed running, Labour would have won the mayoral election. I'm, I'm not up for speaking on behalf of the Labour Party because I'm not a massive fan of them either. Um, <laughs> but on the on, on the incompetency question, actually, what what Darling's admitting incompetency, incompetency on is controlling the banking crisis, not the preceding period. Everyone in the world had no idea what they were doing with the banking crisis. So, and to certainly, I really doubt that David Cameron, in fact, David Cameron was leader of the opposition party in the years running up to the banking crisis, into the crash, and had nothing. He, he wasn't saying, you, we've got to be careful, we've got to stop uh, lending so much money to... No, of David course Scott, he wasn't. So, I'm not um, saying that. As chair, I think I've got to stop the argument. <laughs> Are there any questions for other <coughs> presenters? Uh, Getting into the like nicest. Yeah, um, sympathise with you because I've done a great deal of that paperwork and <laughs> and whatnot. 
And uh, it does make me angry that it takes so long to extend the library hours and that we spend so many years to do that, when instead it seems quicker to be able to support and make uh, Reclaim the Guild campaign successful, to make changes which are then going to allow a whole set of changes similar to those to happen relatively quickly, right? Uh, so I guess supporting that and a couple of other uh, student-led campaigns that have sprung out uh, as a result of the recent politicization, which was inevitable as a result of the changes which were brought so abruptly, uh, such as ideas for you know the, uh, the the housing commune that are floating around, uh, cooperatives, um, and I guess sticking to the to the campaigns, uh, sticking to support, helping people run for those sabbatical positions are great things to do, but personally I'm going to have to admit that I'm a bit pessimistic. Uh, what I wanted to say is that essentially if the elite universities keep going on like this, evidence from America suggests that even though what they've tried to do is open up a system where universities can compete against each other over how much funding they give away for students over the quality of their services, uh, elite universities' demand for places uh, will not go lower. They will then not be uh, forced by the market to keep providing these services. They will not even need to update their services. The smaller institutions <coughs> who don't have like, that kind of demand will fail. And as a whole, I think the system will collapse under its own weight, uh, unless some kind of big political intervention is made relatively soon. But it doesn't seem like labor policies, upcoming labor policies, are going to do that either. So I don't know, good luck, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Um, I wondered, it may have been that I've completely misunderstood in which case I apologise, but I wondered um, whether that's necessarily the case or the case um, in a lot of instances where it might at first seem to be. For example, um, quite often you get the claims that public opinion has changed policy or necessitated the U-turn. And quite often, you know, you get this sort of tabloid campaign, especially like The Sun, and it'll be government listens to The Sun readers, and actually, no, government listens to the media. And so... I don't know whether you could argue that the media is just reflecting um, public opinion at the time or whether it's actually influencing it. But might it not be the case that it's actually a higher, um, someone higher up the tier, sort of almost, well, in fact, definitely on a par with the government in terms of power, that's actually influencing the change and sort of co-opting and pretending that it was um, ordinary people? Yeah, so I can certainly see where you're coming from. And there are two kind of responses that I have. The first is a lot simpler. Um, so I'll start with that one. So, um, coming from a slightly more left-wing perspective, which, sorry, is where I come from, but um, like I, I would say that because of the very nature of those tabloids, uh, they're out there to make money, it's a capitalist game, and that therefore they're going to try and reflect what the public want, or at least try and do something that's going to frame the public mood, uh, because that's how they sell copies. And I'd, I'd argue that potentially that might be one uh, like influence on why they put those headlines out there. But I think the more important thing in this debate, which may be where the slightest understandings come from, is that um, actually um, what I was arguing is that through this increase in online media use and a slightly more pluralised than this argument with Baron Dresner's article, which I've, I can email you if you like, um, is, is really important because it talks about how that those those online media usage and, and that kind of more pluralised media is able to frame the debate, so they're able to limit what we talk about, so that's that kind of third Luke's idea. Um, so you're able to frame what's talked about and therefore you're able to like instigate some sort of policy change because you, you frame it in such a way that your argument becomes much more persuasive. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I was saying with how the lower tiers can influence higher tiers is through that framing and through that restriction on what, what can be discussed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panel.